Kevin, all in's coming up and we figured, and you had this idea months back, we do a sort of big time show about not just this all in event because other podcasts will preview all in, they'll do the match by match. We're more than that. We're giving you more as the podcast listener. What we're doing for you today is a comprehensive sort of, I guess, not AW history, but our, our opinions, our takes, some really provocative questions. There's CM Punk drama we've got to address. There's the All In card. There's a lot encompassing this show. So, Kevin, firstly, most importantly, how you doing, pal? I'm good, pal. It's lovely talking to you. I feel like we've done like a lot of episodes. We did two episodes last week. We got this one coming out this week, man. It's it's crazy. Contents are blowing, pal. How are you? I'm good, pal. I'm good. Um, you guys are listening on the Spotify and the audio platforms. Shout out. Um, plays. Just, you guys are running up the plays. Um, Kevin's lovely ad read sponsors probably going to play sometime around now. So shout out. Um, that being said, pal, no, I'm doing good. We're doing a lot of shows, as you say. Uh, a bit of grading Triple H, a bit of SummerSlam first take sort of elite take content, a bit of some bios, the full sort of mix, giving you, the listener, what you need to hear, pal. Not these other podcasts who will just give you fluff for three hours to run up their watch time and listening time. We give you what you need to hear. So, Kevin, one more, anything, anything else you want to address or should we just... You mentioned Spotify. Right I want to talk about Spotify just for a moment. Can we get some more five-star reviews, please? If you're listening to this on YouTube or whatever platform you're listening to, you can go out of your way, just... Open up Spotify. Take like 10 seconds. Give us a five-star review. If you can do that on Apple Podcasts too, if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts, hit us with a five-star review. Anything helps. Guess us into the algorithm. So we yep. can, uh, you know, we can eventually start doing this for more of like a, a more more than a passion. You know, mm. if we get more reviews and we get into the algorithm, we can do big things with this. So I just want to say that. Yep, no, 100%. And we'll have the links in the description. So literally all you have to do is just like click the Elite Heat link to Spotify or whatever. And it's like, it's like two clicks, takes like five seconds. So Kevin, with that being said, let's jump right into this. So we're, we're talking about all things all in, which by, as obviously a byproduct is all late wrestling and the, the initial, the, the, the first kind of foundation of that. I'm going to throw it to you. A lot of people listening know like the story, know what happened, and, like how it came to be. Some don't. Um, I'll throw it to you. Do you want to give, I guess your version or how you say it what what went down what was the sort of timeline of events that we need to know so really here's what happened here's how all in came to be so you had cody rhodes i would say he spearheaded the thing when he left wwe and he went to the indie scene and he blew up just became one of if not the biggest thing on the indies you couple that with the bullet clubs explosion in new japan and ring of honor with the young bucks kenny omega uh, fergal was in there for a little bit aj styles was in there but when Cody was doing was doing his thing, running wild, Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks, uh, Hangman Page, those were the guys. Those were the pillars of the Bullet Club and the Elite. You had Marty Skrull was in there, and then you know you had Cody would later join them. So all that coupled together, that it became this like conglomerate on the indie scene. You know Kenny Omega was running in New Japan. Then you had Cody and the Young Bucks running the Ring of Honor for the most part. And one day, uh, somebody tweeted at Dave Meltzer. was like, hey, do you think that... I think, I think they asked, do you think um, Ring of Honor could sell out a show at MSG? And Dave Meltzer said something like, there's no way that Ring of Honor or any indie show or anyone other than WWE could do a 10,000-seat arena. So then Cody, the Young Bucks, all these guys, they jump in and they're like, yeah, we'll take that challenge, bro. We'll take that challenge, Dave so then they announced a plan for a show and it, it, nobody really knew if it was ever going to happen like it was just like okay we're gonna have this show and then there was no mention of it and then in the in the summer of uh of 2018 they're just like all right here we go it's official we're gonna have all in it's gonna be in chicago it's gonna be this super indie show so it wasn't an AEW show it wasn't a ring of honor AEW wasn't even a thing yet it wasn't ring of honor it wasn't new japan it wasn't TNA, it wasn't Impact, it was a super indie show that, uh, according to the wrestlers involved, was personally funded by Cody, the Young Bucks, and I think it was just Cody and the Young Bucks. I don't think Kenny Omega was funding it, but it was just those three guys. It's pretty impressive stuff, you know, and the fact that, yeah, I mean, they produced a pretty good card, as we'll discuss in a minute as well. I mean, they got some big names for this, which is the other thing. I mean, they could have done this, and it could have been literally Cody, some Bullet Club friends, 
Young Bucks, and maybe a couple of like indie guys. But I mean, you go up and down this cup and look, look at the names they got for this event. I mean, Rey Mysterio was on this. You got Kenny Omega, obviously, Okada, Abushi, and like it goes up and down. I mean, they they got Stephen Amell, pal. You know, like they, they went up and down. They got they got some names for this. So it wasn't just like a thrown together show with a bunch of sort of lesser lights where it's like, oh, Cody's in the main event. There's a Young Bucks match, and the rest of it's filler. The rest of it is guys you've never heard of. It wasn't like a boxing card in that regard, where it's like you've heard of the main event, but the rest of it, eh. Like this, they, they went from top to bottom. They had a bunch of names on this. And they put effort into it. So that was the first thing I'll say. Um, I'll throw back to you, pal. So you told us just there how kind of it came to be, you know. And then from your perspective, you were more, I guess, with it at the time or just had more of a clue what was going on. 2018 is the time I'm sort of checked out of wrestling at this sort of stage. So I'm not going to touch basis to comment on what it was like at the time. But, I mean, do you have any take on, like, at the time, 2018 – what this was like, you know, how much of a buzz was this getting? Talk to us about, you know, what kind of reception this was getting at the time. Oh, yeah. Let, let me say this, too, about how All In came to be. The most, maybe, I don't know about the most, but maybe the most remarkable aspect of this was that the show was literally built on YouTube. They promoted the show on YouTube. They used Being the Elite. That, that was prime Being the Elite when they were doing, like, the exorcism of Cody. And, you know, you had, like, Kenny Omega doing some crazy stuff. You had Adam Cole dying. You know, when he went to NXT, Adam Cole died. Then he came back to life at, at uh, All Out 2021. So this was peak being the elite before it just became a corporate whitewash show. But they they were promoting this show, basically. Promoting this whole show on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And everybody kind of thought, okay, this is how wrestling is going to be now. Like, this is going to change wrestling forever. This is going to bring in a whole new landscape, a whole new innovation, a whole new philosophy on the way people promote shows and promote pay-per-views. As we see, it didn't really work out that way. AEW now and a Tony Khan, they've kind of gone through um, like the formula, the typical formula of getting a TV show, but I digress on that. Uh, well, what was your original question? I, I forgot. Uh, sort of just, yeah, it's 2018. Obviously, WWE... SmackDown at this stage in 2018 <laughs> sucks. Raw is just unwatchable. This is like Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar for like two years straight when no one wanted them. Disinterest is high with WWE. People are annoyed. People are angry. NXT is getting good reviews. Triple H is doing some stuff there that caters to a, a portion of the audience. But really, what was sort of the reception? You know, you mentioning it was you know, advertised on the social media platforms. It was marketed that way. Was there much of a buzz? Was there like a skepticism at the time? Was it like, yeah, it's happening, but eh, how good can it be? Or was it like, oh my God, this is the best thing since sliced bread? What was it oh, like? there was a huge buzz. The buzz was, was in the States at least, was incredible. I, I went to like a Ring of Honor show. I don't remember what year it was, but I know Cody was on the card. Punishment Martinez, now Damian Priest was there. Uh, the Young Bucks were there. You know, Hangman Page, I think Adam Cole might have still been in Ring of Honor at that time. It was uh, it was in my city, local show. Uh, it was crazy. It was packed. It was like two, 3,000 people there, you know, which is a lot for a Ring of Honor show. Um, and I remember I was trying to get tickets for like a, a New Japan show that was somewhere in Florida. I don't remember where it was, but somewhere a couple hours from me. I was trying to get tickets for that, but it just didn't make sense from a financial standpoint. Uh, it was like supposed to be like Kenny Omega and Okada was supposed to be there, but then it just... The card underwhelmed, so I was like, eh, I don't really want to go. Um, and on top of that, you had the Hot Topic craze that just happened with this like, with this whole ordeal. You had, you walk into a Hot Topic in any mall, like my local mall, any mall in America, you would see Bullet Club t-shirts, you'd see Kenny Omega t-shirts, American Nightmare t-shirts. I had a couple of them. I had like the American Nightmare, um, I had a Young Buck shirt, I just threw them out after some time that i don't know it just didn't really don't really feel like wearing them any it didn't really feel like wearing them anymore but it, there was a craze for it there was a buzz it, it was really unlike anything that i think we had seen in wrestling before that was what was cool about it like i, I imagine what the monday night wars was like and this wasn't like the monday night wars this was an indie show that blossomed it blew up and these guys became stars on their own and the Young Bucks and Kenny and Cody, they didn't need a, a, a what's the word, a machine behind them. Yes. You know? Yeah. No, no big corporate machine, pal. No Ted Turner. 
No WCW machine, no Vince McMahon, no WWE conglomerate, none of that. And I guess one more question for you. Uh, did you watch this show live? I did. Yes. What What was that like? What was watching all in? Because you mentioned, as you say, this is something different. As once as we say, WWE has been the just the only thing really going for 15 years. Yes, TNA tried to get a, a war going in like the start of 2010. That was nothing. This was just its own entity. This was Cody. This was the Bucks. This was a small group taking on a challenge that Dave Meltzer set them on Twitter. So what was it like? What, what was watching All In 2018 like live? Well, talk to us. Well, for one, it was exciting. I had a feel of excitement because I never really uh, thought that there would be an alternative like this to WWE. And that's what you could see was on the horizon. The AEW rumors had already been out for a few months about you know the, the Jacksonville Jaguars owner buying the company. So it was like, okay, this is kind of an audition for this AEW thing. And that's really what this all in, what it turned out to be. I think Tony Khan was there, but kind of buzz. The buzz was crazy. I was so excited to watch it. I thought overall it was a good show. I wasn't blown away. You know, I wouldn't say it was like WrestleMania 17 or 19 or anything like that. But it was really fun. And it, it was just, it was a happy time to be a wrestling fan. Or a wrestling fan of like non-WWE wrestling. That's what I was watching primarily. Like I, I remember at the time I was watching a lot of New Japan. Like one of my one of my closest friends at the time was like super into New Japan. So we'd watch like we'd watch like Omega Okada. I watched all four of those matches. I watched Omega's match with Jericho from I believe uh Wrestle Kingdom in twenty eighteen. Watched a ton of that stuff with Jericho Naito. Like just there was so much buzz. And it was so fun and so exciting and it was cool. It was just different. Like I felt like I had my, my passion back for wrestling. You know, I felt like I had kind of lost it for a lot mm-hmm. of years. In particular, like after like 2009 and 2010, I was watching yeah. Super Cena run a month. Like I kind of gained it back for once in a lifetime. And when Daniel mm-hmm. Bryan was hot, but it was like, okay, Daniel Bryan's the big star. And then everything else sucks. It's just Triple H cutting 20 minute yeah. monologues with Stephanie McMahon standing next to him. So I didn't have a ton of passion for wrestling until like 2017, 18. Yeah, no, no, that's fair. And a lot of people were in that same camp. I remember even myself, I started actively watching, you know, 2011. You watch right through 2012, once in a lifetime. Cena, it's punk. It's the 434 run. 2013, there's some good stuff there. There's the Shield. There's the Wyatt family. 2014's Brian. And, you know, there was a lot of stars at the time. And it was, you know, straight broke. Brock, yada yada. 2015 was, you know, the year of Rollins and the Brock Lesnar stuff with Brian and all this other stuff. 2016, there's a bit of hype for SmackDown. Oh my God, brand split. They tried to change it, but in the long run, they could they just shouldn't have done a brand split anyway. And then basically the whole point being here, you get to 2018, a lot of people have tuned out. Jinder Mahal was WWE champion in 2017. Raw's three hour shows are being main evented by Miz and his entourage of Curtis Axel and Bo Dallas dressed as bears. Mm. You've got like LeVar Ball and LaMelo Ball being on Miz TV as like the main talking point of like a whole month of wrestling because LaMelo Ball said the N-word. Like, like this is the sort of, like, it's not a great time for WWE is what I'm saying. So this all in and everything that encompasses it, oh, in many people, in many wrestling fans' eyes, it was like a beacon of hope for their fandom in that regard because it was something that was, you know, potentially taking off. It wasn't just, WWE going through the motions, producing, you know, bottom of the barrel, terrible television with Roman Reigns. 90% of the fans are booing him. He's saying, I'm the big dog. Brock Lesnar's not showing up. And then Reigns is losing to Brock at every pay-per-view. It's not that. It was wow. something different. It was, oh my God. You know, and that's why, as you say at the time, the buzz was so high. That's why there was a thirst for it. There was a crave for that style of process, just something different, something. Because for years, there'd been pretty much nothing. So. Kevin, I guess I'll ask you now. Oh, but we'll before you ask this, I, I want to—I just want to talk about the hot topic thing just for another second to put really push this home. Like, I, I thought it was wild to me, just mind blowing, to walk into a mall in my city. You know, I don't live in like a particularly big city. You know, I'm like a mm-hmm. suburb of Miami, and you walk in and you walk into a hot topic, and literally you don't see any WWE shirts. You see like one like WrestleMania, whatever WrestleMania 33 shirt, whatever WrestleMania was going on at the time. Then every wrestling shirt is literally like Hangman Page and like Marty Skrull. It was so cool and so unique. And I just don't know what happened. We're going to get into this. 
I just don't know what happened to that buzz. What happened to that the the clout? It, it's remarkable. Like like yeah, yeah, AEW is thriving and all that, but we'll get to it. Yeah, and I guess as we were sort of alluding to with that alternative and what kind of caught led to all in, I think that word is important, alternative, and that's sort of what spawned what would become AW, what spawned this all in show and what spawned all of it is an alternative to what at the time in 2018, 2017, WWE and like mainstream wrestling was just garbage. It was unwatchable. I, I couldn't watch it at the time. I literally in like 2017, so I can't do this. I just, I'm just, I'm not going to watch. And same in 2018. So alternative. And Kevin, that leads me to ask this now. And just talk to us here. I, mean, I don't know if you just from your perspective, on how important that alternative is and like was for wrestling just generally because having more than one an option it, it makes being a fan so much easier it generally brings out the best in both so talk us about alternative pal so here's my thing my take on alternatives i think personally if there's a need for an alternative or there's an alternative that's thriving outside of wwe it's more of a picture and it points back towards wwe and them not doing a good job at being the biggest brand the biggest entity in wrestling when you look across the big four sports i use the big four american sports just for an analogy here i know soccer there's a bunch of different leagues and there's the international play so that really doesn't factor in here when you look at the mlb the nba the nfl and the and the nhl right there is no alternative for any of those you know, yeah, there's other baseball leagues, like there's there's a baseball league in Japan and there's a basketball league in France and Greece and and in um uh, Australia and Turkey. Yeah, there's the AFL, the Australian Football League, which is kinda of, I guess an alternative, but it doesn't make a lot of noise here or in, in general yeah. in the rest of the world, you know? And there's not really much of an alternative for the NHL. Like, like, if you told me, hey, I watch Japanese baseball every night. Like, that pitcher in Japan, oh, my God, he throws a better changeup than Max Scherzer and Jacob deGrom. I would look at you like you're fucking nuts, you know? <laughs> like, why are you watching Japanese basketball or Japanese baseball, Japanese hockey? So it was like, it got to the point where us as wrestling fans in America were so starved for good wrestling content that we were staying up till 3, 4 in the morning watching New Japan or going out of our way to watch Ring of Honor. And watch being the elite. And that, that really shows that WWE was not doing a good job at being the entity that they're supposed to be. When you look at the MLB, the NHL, the NBA, yes, those leagues have problems, yes. But at the end of the day, the NFL still has the best football players in the world. The NBA still has the best basketball players in the world. There's not a prospect out in Germany playing in the, in the German league for basketball that's like, oh, this guy is better than Luka Doncic. This guy is better than LeBron James. No, that doesn't exist. You know, WWE should have all the best wrestlers in theory. Should be yeah. the one and only entity and should give you good quality content. But we didn't get that for so, so many years after the sale of, and, and the, the purchase. Of, or, I'm sorry, after the, the, the going public and the purchase of WCW. We didn't really get that. So I don't know. I, I don't know. Like, I guess what I'm trying to say in long form is that I don't really think in in a perfect world. I don't think there's room for two big wrestling promotions. I, I guess what you're saying is, if the main I mean, company, the main entity is doing its job, there shouldn't be a need for the number two. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's exactly what it is because you know, in principle, yes, that's exactly right. But you know, obviously, this is 2017, 2018. I mean, Superkick Studios is doing a video. I don't know if it's come out yet, but he's doing a video on 2017 to 2019 WWE. Mm. And like that. Why? Whole... What is wrong with him? I know. I, I, I was saying when I heard about this, I'm like, that, has, that should be like an hour and a half long to highlight all the, the bad in there. Like that is awful. Um, so Shout out to him for going through that torture. Yep. Yeah, shout out to Superkick. I know you listen to at least some of our shows. So shout out. I don't know why you're doing that to yourself. Good on you. You deserve your 100K subs and your, your plaque. Yeah, that's um, for sure. For that especially. Yeah. Uh, but... That being said, yeah, the alternative was needed. So when it comes to all in, Kevin, and then because I'll transition this now into, I mean, you touched on, you thought the show was good, pretty good. You know, it wasn't WrestleMania 17, but I guess, you know, I'm not asking here for like a full in-depth match by match review, but I guess, you know, you watching this live, what in your opinion was either match of the night or most memorable? Just talk to us about all in the event generally. Really, the main thing that I remember is Cody versus Nick Aldis. 
That's the one that always jumps to the, the top of my brain. That was a good like twenty minute old school Southern style tr- traditional NWA like wrestling match that you know Dusty and Ric Flair would have or Piper and um what's his name uh, Greg Valentine would have like something like that. It was like one of those like old school matches you know that Bret Hart would look at and say, "Damn, that is a good wrestling match." I respect those two guys, you know, and guys like Jim Cornette and guys like that would look at you know. Um, I thought it was a big moment seeing Cody as a baby face after being a heel for so long. Like Cody literally was a heel from the time he went to in- to the Indies until this show pretty much. He became a baby face for the simple fact that he put this show on. Like people loved him so much just for making all in, just for making this yeah. indie indie uh scene like craze that happened in 2017-18. And seeing him win the title with you know his family out there with and his friends, Tommy Dreamer, Diamond Dallas Page, Glacier, Brandy. Uh, the use of Glacier, I think, is interesting. I know he was a, a, a like a great friend of his father, so I understand why he's there. But when you just tell people that don't know the backstory, like, hey, Glacier's there. They're like, wait, what? Glacier? The, the Mortal Kombat ripoff character from WCW in the mid-90s? Why is he there? But, um, yeah, that that's what sticks out for me. Uh, I particularly enjoyed Kenny Omega versus Penta L Zero thought that was a damn good match and i would say those two matches there are the highlights for me and also i want, I want your thoughts as well because i'm my, my opinion on this just generally having seen this back with the main event the got the golden elite pal it's abushi in the box against you know ray mysterio ray phoenix and bandito pal your thoughts on that main event because to me it was like that was the last match yes that didn't feel like the main event I don't know that that was my sort of takeaway. It felt like that Cody Aldis match, like the main event. That was the peak. Like. That but, was the peak of the yeah. show. That that yeah, mm-hmm. Cody and Aldis is when the show peaked for sure. You know, the crowd got back up for Omega and Pentel Zero, and I thought Okada and Marty Scurll went kind of long, but that match main eventing was really just because the Young Bucks could main event because they're paying for the show. They're like, yeah, we're gonna main event. Makes sense. I I'm, who am I to disagree with them? You got Rey Mysterio in the match. The way I look at it for me, like you have Rey Mysterio, who Rey Mysterio realistically is the biggest name on this show, aside from Jericho making his appearance, which was just an appearance. Rey Mysterio is the biggest advertised name, excuse me, that you have on this show. Why not do Okada versus Rey Mysterio? You know, or Omega versus Rey Mysterio. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or Cody versus well, no, no, Cody's doing his thing. I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting main event. It fits for that audience. It really worked well. With that audience in Chicago, with that indie audience, yeah, they love the six man tag matches, the multi man matches, the the matches. I look like you just took a, a a line of cocaine, you're going crazy, a lot of moves going on. Like that that style works. I've been in the crowd for indie shows. That that's what works at indie shows. No, hundred percent, I get that. You know, I just find it. I still, you know, when I watch this back and I want, I look back at this show in preparation. I'm like. Interesting main event match choice, you know, like as you say, you'd think it would be yeah, Mysterio versus Okada. Mysterio. What one of these, like, I mean, we see it nowadays with Forbidden Door with what AW New Japan do. One of these big matches where you take two just like legends, two big stars of each other company, or just two stars generally, pit them together, have that be the marquee. But no, I, I get it. I get it. It was more so just a match because I mean, this wasn't supposed to be WrestleMania 17. This was just a showcase of, hey, we can sell out the building. You know, this was just a sort of exhibition show. So I won't look too much into the fact that it was a interesting main event choice, just as you say. Guess the- so, Kevin, we've just discussed, you know, the all-in card and everything that encompasses that. I guess now the question being, you've got MJF, who's now five years later, the AW world champion. At this show, he opened against Matt Cross. Okay, match. It wasn't Eva Marie's wardrobe malfunction, but it wasn't Taker Sean. It's okay opening match. I guess talk to us about MJF, you know. Would you say he's the biggest... I mean, success story since All In. He's the, would you say he's the AW or just the talent generally outside of WWE who's excelled the most? He's thrived the most, pal? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if we're talking about the non elite uh, talent, you know, you're, you're excluding like Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks and Hangman and Cody and Punk. Yeah, MJF has to be the most important piece for AEW. But MJF right now is doing crazy numbers. He's drawing ratings. He's selling merch with him and Adam Cole in this storyline they're doing. He's main eventing this all in 2023 show. Presumably, he's going to be the main event. The guy is the face of AEW. 
And it was like, when I saw him at this show, and I was like, okay, this guy has it. You could see it. Just by the way he was committed to his character. By the way that he cuts his promos. And he's a true old school wrestler with new school flavor and, and the, the use of social media and you know the, the modern uh, verbiage and things like that all in one package. There's nobody like him in wrestling right now I, that, I, that I could think of. He's the most committed to his character of anybody from this generation. He'll come into an autograph signing and tell a little girl to fuck off. You know, like a little girl that wants to get a picture with him. He doesn't care. He's going to be a heel 24-7. When he's MJF, he's going to be a heel. At airports, autograph signings, whatever. Uh, appearances. Like, he did an appearance on Impractical Jokers last year. And he was acting like a heel on Impractical Jokers. You know, so... Yeah, the guy is, uh, he was money then, in 2018. Cody saw it. A MJF, really, the, the discovery of MJF has to be Cody's greatest contribution to AEW. When, when it's all said and done, I, I think that's what his legacy would be. What Cody's legacy would be in AEW, aside from the, the, fact that, the fact that he started it, spearheaded it, and all that. But his greatest contribution to the product has to be his discovery of MJF. No, 100%. 100%. And to think of this time all in 2018 mjf was 22 which is ridiculous like I know I'm, I'm 20 and i know in wrestling terms you don't just you're not just 18 19 and burst on the sense that doesn't happen in wrestling usually you're mid-20s generally you go through training for years work your way up through independent circuits work towns learn the craft it's years of almost like a mastery thing and then as i'm saying nowadays kevin most wrestlers are coming into especially double of your mid-30s late thirties and forties, even for some wrestlers like MJF 22 here. And you can see this, you know, the star he would become now he's 27. He's had a number of accolades. He's been, in my opinion, at least the brightest you know, star. And the thing you look forward to most consistently throughout the five years since this, yes, there's been some good stuff with CM Punk off and on, as we'll discuss later on, Kevin, we'll get to CM Punk. There's been some good stuff across the board. Generally, you know, your Brian Danielson matches, your, Stadium Stampedes, your Moxleys, and everything else AW's provided and that alternative's provided. But really, MJF, to me, has been the consistent bright spot and the brightest prospect amongst all that. And Kevin does make it interesting. Does he move across the WWE? I think he's due to go. I think he's ready to move across the WWE. Bigger, broader horizons. Triple H is running it now. It's not like Vince is just going to have him wearing dog costumes and barking at people. So, ways to be seen. But Kevin... Anything on more MJF, or do you want to move along, pal? No, keep going. No, that's all good, pal. That's all good. So I'll ask you this. Um, I don't know how you want to interpret this, but Kevin, in the Macho Man bio with Randy Savage, I keep the floor to you, and you provided, it was like 15 to 20 minutes of information that I know myself, some listeners who've commented about this, hadn't heard before. Um, so with the, regards to, I mean, AW, All In, I don't know if you have anything. I'm not asking you give us a 45-minute everything we could ever know thing because there isn't much on it yet because of the sort of coverage. But do you have any news stories, even just AW news generally? Well, there's not really anything in regards to this show or in regards to, like, early AEW that's really out there that's, like, public knowledge. But all the beef between, like, Cody and the Elite and Tony Khan, all that stuff I'm sure will come out in, like, 10 years from now or something like that. But right now, there's not really a lot that I could find out of dirt on this show. But I mean, when you talk about news, the biggest news in AEW is CM Punk. CM Punk is in the news yet again. I believe the story broke was the 18th. I want to say the story broke on the 13th, right after the last week's collision tapings. Yeah. Sorry, pal. I just want to... It's Phil Brooks, pal. I'm CM rocking Punk, the shirt pal. too, pal. I got the same one. Your name, Ryan Namath. Get the F out of my typing, pal. It's my collision. Anyway, carry on. Yeah, so carry rumors on. come out that first Ryan Namath got sent home from the AEW collision tapings because he made a tweet that was not favorable against CM Punk. That's the first story that breaks. Then Hangman Page is not allowed to, to show up at collision. Uh, he was booked there to do like something to promote the next week's Dynamite or something last week. And he ends up just staying in a hotel post an Instagram story like, hey, bro, I'm out here in Greensboro, you know, can't show up at the show because CM Punk won't let me in, whatever. 
Then it comes out that Matt Hardy and Christopher Daniels got sent home from Collision. Like is that, that's, Christopher Daniels like an executive? Yeah, he's the manager of talent relations. He's he's a corporate guy. So the the point here is CM Punk allegedly has veto power, has full control creatively over what transpires at AEW Collision. And Tony Khan is just like, here, Phil, this is your show. You do what you want with it. You have whoever you want on the show, which we knew. We knew this was CM Punk colliding with his buddies. Um, it's really like so silly. Like, like let's be honest here. I don't want to be too scathing or too harsh because I really can't stand talking about behind the scenes CM Punk news. I'm so over talking about this stuff. Like, I'm not, I'm up to here with it, really. Everybody talks about it because it's CM Punk and he draws numbers and he's a big star and everybody holds on to that two years he had in his prime. That two years he had on top. Everybody holds on to that. Nobody remembers that he was a fucking bum before that. He was a, a mid-card guy at best. Uh, up until he cut a, a work shoot promo on John Cena in the middle of the ring on Raw. Then he became everybody's favorite wrestler. But nobody gave a damn about him. In 2008, when he was getting punt kicked by Randy Orton and not even losing his championship in a real de- in a real title defense, he got punt kicked in a damn backstage segment, lost his championship. Nobody cared, but he came out in 2011 and said this company would be better off when Vince McMahon is dead, and he's been riding off that one promo for 12 years. Am I wrong? Correct me. Stop me. Stop me when I'm saying something wrong, please. To, to quote Tell Philip Jack I'm Brooks. Lies. Tell me I'm telling lies, pal. No, um, you got, got any more? You know, keep yeah, going. Keep of course, going. yes. Sorry. Uh, so, now, this guy has... Oh, my God. He has... What's the word I'm looking for? I'm trying to think of a proper phrasing, phrasing for this. He's cohorted Tony Khan into giving him staying power and full creative control over a TV show. That is remarkable. Imagine, let's just say this. Let's say it's 1996, right? You know, Monday Night Raw is on the air. Let's say Shawn Michaels goes into Vince McMahon's office and he's like, all right, I can't work with Bret Hart. I can't stand this fucking guy. I'm over it. I'm done with Bret Hart. And he's like, all right, here's my proposition. We're going to make a Friday night show. We're going to call it SmackDown. Me, Shawn Michaels, I'm going to be fully in charge of the show. It has nothing to do with you, Vince McMahon. You're just paying the bill. You're paying the bill. You're negotiating the contracts. But I'm in charge creatively over everything that goes on in this show. This could be me, Triple H, X-Pac, Kevin Nash, all the guys from the Click. Everybody that likes the Click is allowed on the show. Anybody that has any slight disagreement, slight negative thing to say about the Click, fuck you. You're not allowed in our tapings for Friday Night Smackdown. That's literally what is going on here with AEW. CM Punk has enough creative control and enough juice to say, get the fuck out of my TV tapings. And then there was the, ru- the reports, not rumors, the reports about Jack Perry. Jack Perry wanted to do a segment because he had a vacation coming up. He wanted to do a backstage segment, a pre taped segment that was going to air on Dynamite on Saturday night where he like punched a, a, a car window or whatever. CM Punk said, uh-uh, uh-uh, take that amateur shit back to wednesday night literally apparently he said that according to the rumors take that amateur shit to wednesday night we don't do that here on saturday night in my show so yeah so jack perry got sent away jack perry got into a heated argument with cm punk they were they were curse words going out cm punk this guy's impossible to work with he didn't want wwe because there was too much corporate too much uh what do you have what do you have too many filters and then now he wants AEW, he wants the alternative. He wants indie wrestling. But he's trying to de-indie AEW. He wants what WWE does on Collision. He wants an entertainment show. He wants it to be serious wrestling. Can't win with the guy. As you say, Kevin, I mean, he became famous. and He, he broke out from the, the mid-card purgatory that he was in the late 2000s. He broke out in 2011 by empowering the indies, empowering the voiceless, empowering, you know, I'm going to take the New Japan Pro Wrestling. Maybe I'll go back to Ring of Honor. He became famous by empowering that on a WWE scope. 
So it, it's interesting now, as you say, and as those reports lead to, and as that all implies, that Phil Brooks backs age on collision and just generally is trying to make it a more professional, polished, WWE sort of... That's what I mean by polish, just WWE, not not indie, not you know, uh, not an alternative. He's trying to make it more like WWE, just maybe without a few less filters up the top. But Punk is the filter now, I guess. Phil Brooks is the filter. I think that analogy you made with Shawn Michaels in '96 is just phenomenal. That's basically exactly what this is, quite literally in every way. Oh, I don't want to work with Bret Hart, the other kind of top guy, top star at the time. Oh, but let's make my own show on. You know, later in the week, we're going to have all my friends, all the people who like my friends. Tony, you're paying for it. Deal with it. Like, <laughs> unreal. It's ridiculous. Unreal. I, I don't want to say it's the downfall of AEW. I'm sorry, just to interject. I don't want to say it's the downfall of AEW, but it's really not good for them from a business perspective to be allowing a guy like CM Punk to just run amok and do whatever the hell he wants. And then he, on top of that, it's not like he's drawing ratings. What did the last collision do? Like 400,000 viewers? They're not going to be making too much plata on that, or money, as I should say. They're not going to be making too much money on advertisement dollars. Well, Kevin, I'll ask you this now. So, this obviously, this show, is, it's all about all-in. We're talking about the initial all-in, all that. I just find it fascinating. I'll phrase it this way, because I love my phrasing. So, it's 2018. You're at Hot Topic. you got this buzz going for this all-in show. You're excited. You're thinking, oh, my God, this is... This isn't double. This is something fresh, something new. Cody, you're the Bucks. Oh my God. Like, what's going to go down here? This is a big event. Five years later, all like, what that turns into, the alternative, the thing that spawns from that is it's called All Elite Wrestling. It's a whole company, but it's been marred now by one show is just CM Punk trying to hijack a whole company to benefit himself. That's one product on a Saturday night two hours drawing oh bang God. average and mediocre the poor ratings and then the wednesday show is you know there's, there's a good storyline with mjf and cole so there's you know good storyline but across the board I, I don't even know how to phrase it like just generally the question being kevin five years ago you're watching this all-in build it's you know hyping you up you know what could be it's like you know oh my god oh my god what are they going to do now five years later having seen what you've seen how would you assess it? How would you assess the last five years in a nutshell for what, what we've produced? Is this just like the, the great alternative? Is it, you know, good, bad, you're indifferent? Talk to us. It's a great question. I wanted to bring this up. I wanted to make this point. And I'm glad you asked it. All in 2018, that, has, that is a far cry from what AEW has been. That was what we thought we were getting. We thought we were getting Okada. We thought we were getting um, other stars from New Japan, Naito, guys like that on a regular basis. But then apparently New Japan got hot at Kenny Omega and they hated him for leaving. So they've made the, the working relationship a little bit more strenuous mm -hmm. than one might have envisioned. But I thought, like, let me just look at the card. Let me see. I believe, yeah, you had Okada on the card. Was he the only? Oh, yeah, then you had Kode Ibushi. So I was thinking, okay, these guys could be regular, not regulars, but they'll be reoccurring stars in AEW. You know, we we'll get a, maybe Okada will be here. Maybe the first double or nothing will have Okada, Ibushi, Naito, guys like that. And it would be a mix of, you know, AEW original talent and some New Japan guys that would, would come through through this working relationship with AEW. Because, like, we thought Kenny Omega was going to bridge that gap. And this show really, I mean, the AEW really try it away from what we saw at the show i was reading online just in preparation for this podcast mm -hmm. that there were three or four stars that competed in a match that actually end up being like that are actually on aew in 2023 is mjf and hangman the bucks and what phoenix and penta and omega and that's really yeah. it None of the other guys, Joey Janela's gone from AEW. Christopher Daniels, Kazarian, all those guys work in the office. You know, Tessa Blanchard's not there. Chelsea Green ain't there. Madison Rain ain't there. Britt Baker is there. Cody's not there. Nick Aldis not there. Joey Janela, I said he's gone. Jay Lethal, I guess he's there. I don't even know if he's on AEW anymore. I hardly ever see him. 
Flip Gordon ain't there. Marty Skrull ain't there. Rey Mysterio obviously is not there. Bandito's not there. Ibushi's not there. It, it And the only match that featured two, or the only match that featured anyone that carried over to AEW, all competitors in the match, singles match, tag team match, is Omega versus Penta. That's the only match from this card that the two competitors are still employed by AEW. So I, I, it was something that I think for me personally, I was expecting this with AEW. And I think that's kind of why I cooled off on it, on AEW as a product. Mm. Just because like, I realized, okay, this is not what we're getting. This is Tony Khan just signing whoever he can from WWE, putting them out there for a couple weeks. Oh, it's Cesaro. Oh, oh it's Keith Lee. Oh, my God. You know, then the next one. Oh, it's Lacey Evans. Lacey Evans in the impact zone, pal. Game changer, pal. Game changer. Yeah, like that's for lack of a better term or better phrasing. Like that's what AEW has become. Just like a knockoff WWE in a lot of aspects. And all in 2018 felt fresh, felt different, felt like a, a, an encapsulating formula. You know, now we got CM Punk and his politics and Jericho and his politics and the Young Bucks and their politics. It's just like WCW 99, WCW 2000 yep. at this point. It's not anything that we thought it would be in 2018. The fact that Cody's not there anymore. You know, Cody, the show is built around Cody. Really, mm-hmm. all in 2018 was built around him. And he was the biggest star on the show. He was the guy, the face of the show. And he's not there anymore. Tony Khan was like, see you later, pal. I got Phil Brooks. Don't need you. Good luck. Good luck in your future endeavors. And, yeah, yeah I mean, a big piece of AEW has been missing since Cody left, honestly. Well, Cody... In that regard, Cody was the heartbeat of AEW. And I mean, as, as you discussed, and I'll just briefly summarize what you said in about 30 seconds. You have all this promise in 2018, this fresh feeling show, this different alternative. And then this, Kevin, is what happens with the main stars from there. Jericho has the world title. He's like the, the mainstream face in 2019. He gets ruined by an Orange Cassidy feud. We were talking about this at the time in 2020. That derailed Jericho's momentum. They tried after that the Jericho Appreciation Society, Jericho and Guevara. Don't forget the NBA Twitter thing. That kind of killed... That That was really the death nail in Jericho's run in AEW. <laughs> Once NBA Twitter saw him, that was it. <laughs> yeah, no, that too. That too. That and Cassidy. But yeah, NBA Twitter, a bunch of Boston Celtics fans angry after a Milwaukee Bucks game, going on Twitter being like, who the hell... This is fat Jericho. What is this knockoff wannabe garbage WWE like it's literally the, the premise of what we're saying but yeah so there's Jericho Kevin um, the Omega one's interesting because as you say 2018 he's having the Okada matches he's like you think oh my god Omega's gonna be in North American wrestling he's gonna be like the big star of this new alternative thing they're doing oh my god Omega 2019 2020 it's this like slow burn tag team thing with Paige you know I guess the story was good, but it, they weren't, didn't strike all the island was hot with Omega. Then in 2021, they give him like a year long title run in front of like no fans or like Daly's Place plant fans from who are employees, you know. <laughs> and he's 69ing Don Callis. He's reading books to little children in kindergarten. It's like, okay, I mean that's Kenny Omega. That is the guy who everyone was looking forward to having seven star matches in AEW. And, and what what like, what you're what you're saying is that we thought. In America, we were going to get Omega Okada at an, at yes. an AEW show. We were going to get yes. Omega versus Ibushi. This big feud of them having their breakup, you know, breaking up their personal relationship and playing yes. it out on screen. We haven't got any of that shit. You know, we got Omega and Osprey in a good match at all at um uh their, their collab show in 2023. Yeah, Forbidden Door. Forbidden Door, yeah. But I thought, like, yeah, yeah. Double, I thought Double or Nothing 2019. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'll just say this. I thought Double or Nothing 2019 was going to be main evented by, like, Omega Okada. You know, yeah, and because not that we were promised per se, because it's a bit dramatic wording, but what you thought and what the, the, the overwhelming consensus feeling was as you talk about there, and just you say this online, you say this that we'd say, yeah, those Jap- Japanese guys, the ones you mentioned, they're really the main three Okada, Ibushi, Naito, mainly Ibushi with the Got Lovers thing, that was like a huge storyline, uh, you know, in New Japan and all that. Okada being like the big star of that promotion, even like guys like you know, Naito, Tanahashi's. Those sort of guys, you figured you'd see like a hybrid of them mixed with like American wrestling and they'd have some incredible six star matches, big events. It'd be like New Japan, but like an American version, which sort of that's what all in 2018 you thought because those stars were there. So you thought that. 
No, none of those guys have meaningful impact at all. Abushi has made like what, one appearance. It has even has he? Or like yeah, he did. He yeah. made an appearance that he got criticized for not looking like in, in good physical shape, in good ring shape. Exactly. And then one more thing, Cody Rhodes. And I guess this, this can transition the discussion to Cody. This guy, he is front and center, Kevin, the face of all in. He is on the poster. He is the middle of the poster. You've got the Young Bucks next to him, but he is the middle of the poster. He's the one who really, as you say, spawned a lot of the, the kind of running for this. He was the one who was the catalyst. He had the momentum in 2016, 2017, first half of 2018 on the Indies as the heel. And what happened? You know, it was a botched job from, I guess, his own booking of himself, AW. It was just a mess. As we've discussed infamously on our shows, Kevin, it felt like he was cutting Shakespearean monologues as behind him is an acrobatic circus. There was a disconnect from the jump, Kevin. And I guess further now, Cody should have been and should be AW's biggest stars. There should be like a massive year-long storyline of the passing the torch to MJF. They did Cody MJF like three months into AW being on television. It was good, but it could have been so much more. Cody was then cutting promos on a go-go. He's got the TNT title when it's unfinished. Mike Tyson's sleeping during TNT title matches. He comes out looking like the lazy town villain with black hair. He has a great match with Brody Lee. Rest in peace, Brody Lee. And then Cody's cutting you know cryptic promos about starting the revolution, but that being taken away from him and losing his passion. Fans are throwing his white belt back at him. Kevin, point bang, I'll ask you this. Would you say Cody was either the biggest, I mean, of what I've just listed, Jericho, Omega, Cody, the Japanese wrestlers, everything that all them promised, would Cody Rhodes have been the biggest letdown in AW? You know, I I don't know. Biggest letdown, that's a big, that's a, a very bold statement. I don't know mm. if I can say that, but I want to say this. I want to preface my answer with this statement. I remember vividly watching the uh, the Being the Elite episode when the Young Bucks and Cody and all those guys they they did a, a spoof on the uh, the invasion the WCW invasion that DX did. Are you familiar with that? Have you seen it? Or you know about it? I have seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like yeah. a Raw in LA in 2018 or 2017, yeah. and you know they came in with the tank. I think it was Cody, the Young Bucks, and Hangman Page. And I remember vividly. You can hear people in like like. Just regular people that were there waiting in line for the show. You can hear them describing what's happening. And you hear someone say, oh, that's Dusty Rhodes' son. And I don't know who these other guys are. But the, the, that guy, I know he's a wrestler. He's Dusty Rhodes' son. And that was kind of the thing. It's like, when you look at casual people, everyday people who don't watch wrestling, who know nothing about wrestling, who are, who are going to a Raw in Southern California because their grandson wants to see John Cena perform. They're like, oh, okay, I know this guy. He's Dusty Rose's son. I know him. I don't know who Kenny Omega is and these other guys. AEW did not use that star capability, that star power that Cody had. AEW did not utilize that to its full potential. And part of that, I think, was probably Cody, his own, but his own philosophy. I'm sure he didn't want to book himself into the championship position. He didn't want to be looked at as Triple H. That was his thing. He killed the throne at Double or Nothing 2019 with the sledgehammer. And if he knew if he had become AEW champion, like, really quick off the bat, everybody would have been like, oh, he's doing, like, Triple H, booking himself in the long matches, booking himself to be champion, doing this, that, and the other. So he cornered himself into a hole, just really put himself, really backed himself into a corner in an impossible position when he said he would never challenge for the AEW title again if he lost to Jericho. That was, what, like, four months into the company? That was, like, November 2019? Like, what, eight weeks, yeah. ten weeks into Dynamite, Cody's out there. Like, I will never challenge for the championship again. And that, that was kind of it. Like, Cody never really, just he just could not recover from that. It was hard, you know. It was hard to recover. Then he was, like, the, the face of the TNT championship. And, yeah, that's cool, you know. But you're Cody Rhodes, bro. Like, yeah, you know, he should have been the guy that was in important matches and important storylines. He should have been the focus from a single standpoint. He should have been the focus of that company. And he wasn't after that MJF feud. After the MJF feud concluded, he was doing whatever with whoever up-and-coming guy, Sammy Guevara, Agogo, um, Darby Allen, you name it. Cody's wrestling that guy, feuding with that guy. You know, they, didn't, they, they could have got more out of Cody Jericho. They could have got more out of Cody MJF. 
you know you, you think like you picture um what is that what is that show called the AEW new japan pay-per-view forbidden door That's you, you picture like forbidden door that easily should be main evented by cody versus okada you know or something like that but it, it just didn't work out that way no, 100%. And because, yeah, I mean, the main reason I asked this is because, I mean, now you watch Cody, he main evented WrestleMania 39. He's presented like like the big, biggest baby face the last 10 years. He's doing a phenomenal job in his WWE role. They're really presenting him as what you say. That's the, the son, that, that's the one who has the wrestling lineage, the wrestling family. That, that is a wrestling star. And that's how he's being presented in WWE. The presentation is phenomenal. It just, it all works with Cody. And more than likely, in six odd months from now, he's going to be gearing up for his second WrestleMania main event. You know, and it's 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 fascinating to see because you look at Cody. I remember vividly that promo he cut before. I think it was the TNT title unification thing with Guevara. This was like end of 2021, beginning of 2022. He's got like the the, the ladder is in the ring, and he cuts that promo. It's like a cryptic sort of promo. He basically is implying, "I gave my all for this, and you all rejected me. I'm the reason this is a thing." And, you know, I get none of the, I get booed out of buildings. My white belt gets thrown back at me. Kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere. That's what he sort of him. That was basically the primo. And, you know, can you blame him? Like, that was when he said he wouldn't be around long enough to wrestle Punk either, right? Uh, yeah, basically. Yeah. He's like, you know, they even play, they reference Punk. Oh, the voice of the voiceless started this 10 years ago. And I picked up the ball and ran with it and gave you, the fans, what you wanted. And, you know, for that, I get booed and I get you know, all this sort of thing. So... Yeah, it's, it's an interesting story. And I guess Cody is emblematic and symbolic to me of AEW yes. and everything involving the alternative. Yeah, It started off so much potential, 2018, 2019. You're like, oh my God, what can this be? What can he do? And then 2020, you know, still pretty good stuff. And then the pandemic sort of hits and it becomes a bit murky and you don't know there's some good spots. There's some stuff that's really like WTF, what is this? And then as it goes on, Punk comes back and then it becomes just about Punk and the elite and drama and Cody leaves and now now it is what it is. MJ and Cole is you know really good, getting good numbers, good ratings. The stuff with Punk and Ricky Starks I like, but you know behind the scenes on Collision, there's all the stuff as you talk about where it's just there's so much behind the scenes with this company. So yeah, um, there's that. Kevin, any more thoughts on that, pal? No, not really. The only thing I want to say about Cody just tie a knot in this. Yeah, Cody used AEW to get back to WWE and become the star that he knew he could be. I mean, like that that catchphrase or the monologue that he uses from what what was it? Uh, un unwanted to undeniable is that what it's called? Undesirable to undeniable, yeah. Undesirable to undeniable. He made himself to the point where Vince McMahon was flying to his house to get him back in WWE when he found out that his contract in AEW was over. And Cody went from being a guy that was in mid card matches, under card matches at Stardust and. You know, just he could never catch on. He had 1,700 gimmicks in his time in WWE, his first time in WWE. Nothing ever caught on. But he knew he could be better. And he, when he did that, he formed this super indie faction. And then he formed AEW. And then he just, it was to the point where it was like, yeah, we need that guy. We gotta have him. We gotta have that version of Cody on our show. And one thing, I know no one likes to give Vince McMahon credit for anything, ever, you know, whatever. Vince McMahon himself was watching the same things we were watching, Kevin. He was watching Cody in these mid-card, throwing together matches. His white belt's being thrown back at him. Crowd's disinterested. He's getting, the, the, the creator of this thing is just getting turned on by the audience for over a year. Vince McMahon watched that and goes, that's my star. That's the next baby face. That's the guy who's going to take on Roman. That, that's what Vince saw to fly to Cody's house and pitch that to him and say, you're better than this. We can do this, this, and this with you. You deserve better. That was that Vince was the one who flew. So yeah. And now we've seen what Cody's done and he continues to do. And he's on the bright spots of WWE now in 2023, going into 2024, Kevin. So speaks for itself, really. And that's the thing about Cody. Cody from day one when he stepped on the indie scene. The indie fans hated him. They rejected him. They were like, Oh, you're Dusty Rose's son. You're a, a product of a corporate environment. You're a WWE guy. We don't want you. Uh. And eventually that was gonna come about. Even in AEW, there was only a matter of time where the honeymoon phase was like, okay, we love this guy because he created AEW, because he's one of the pillars of this company. Eventually, that was going to wear off, and it was going to go back to what it was, where it's like, this guy is a WWE guy. Fuck him. We don't like him. And what made Cody so good in the beginning when he went to the indie scene was like, yeah, I'm going to be a heel. I'm going to talk about how I, I grew up with a silver spoon. 
how I know Triple H and how I know Vince McMahon and how I don't need to be here in the Indies. I'm doing this because I want to. And he just didn't he didn't want to be a heel in AEW. Which is fair. More power to him. He 100%. wanted to be that baby Kevin, face. Yeah. And Kevin, that transitions us now. So now we sit here. For me, it's a Sunday morning in the middle of August 2023. There's a, you know, about, you know, next coming week to two, we're going to get all in. Uh, 2023, the you know, five year later version of All In. It's going to take place at Wembley Stadium. They've broken the record now officially for most tickets sold where it's like paying tickets where people actually have to pay for them. They haven't just been given out at the gate, sort of thing. So they've broken that record. The tagline for the event, Kevin, is the biggest event in wrestling history, is literally the tagline they're running with. Uh, I guess for you, where are you at with this show? Like, talk to us from your point of view. It's coming up. Where's your interest at? You know, is there a match or thing that you're most looking forward to? Talk to us. My interest is like at a six. I'd say a solid six. I'm going to read the card here just for a moment. Let's go through this. Uh, it's a seven match card. So you have FTR versus the Young Bucks. That match roughly is taking place about six years too late. It was about six years ago when, you know, the Young Bucks were doing the whole fuck the revival thing. And there was a lot of buzz, and people really wanted to see that. They were the two best tag teams in the world. Now, in 2023, I'm not too hot on that match. Yes, it's going to be a good match. Yeah, we get that, but I don't really need to see it the same way I felt like I needed to see it in 2018, 2019, especially when like FTR was or the Revival were doing segments shaving each other's backs on Raw. Yeah, not really a ton of intrigue there. But it's also notable because Cash Wheeler just got a gun charge and get put against him. Just got arrested a few days ago. So the, I don't even know if the match is going to take place. Apparently it is. That's interesting in and of itself. Good. Sorry. G- g- double take for a second. Yeah. Cash Wheeler got a gun charge a couple of days ago and the match is probably going to go ahead. Yeah, he got arrested like Last month, I want to say. Last month he got arrested. Not arrested. Yeah, he got arrested last month for flashing a gun at somebody in Orlando in a road rage incident. And then he got, yeah, he got like trial a few days ago, or the story came out a few days ago. And now it's all like big news now. So yeah, that came out. Yeah. What's today? We're recording this Saturday. Yeah. That came out on Friday, Thursday ish. All right. Like three days okay. before the show, <laughs> it comes out that Cash Wheeler has a gun charge and is in court. You know, I don't even know. I, I don't. Well, know. Kevin, Kevin, as we know, wrestling fans, especially like that AW, they don't care as long as they put good matches on AW. They don't care what's going on behind the scenes. They don't care about the wrestlers' health, the wrestlers' safety. As I found with the Brian Danielson thing in 2021, they don't care as long as the matches are good. Who cares? Anyway, Kevin, carry on with the card. That's it. Uh, then we have Hikaru Shida defending her AEW Women's Championship uh, versus Tony Storm, Soraya, and Britt Baker. Um, interesting. You know, people criticize WWE for doing multi-women matches all the time. Tony Khan writes their name on a piece of paper. No big deal. Um, I, I don't know what to say about this. Soraya is what she is. Britt Baker, uh, she made the rounds on Twitter for a lot of people saying she needs to go to back to the Performance Center and learn how to take bumps. And then Tony Storm is hot with an OnlyFans. And Kenny Omega loves Hikaru Shida because she's from Japan. There you have it. Kevin, five years ago, if you said in five years, the AW, the next time they do All In, it's going to be in five years, the women's title match will be Soraya, as a page, the one with all the scandal controversy, the Del Rio drama, just infamous scandals involving her, XWE. Tony Storm, just we're not just next WWE talent. I mean, Britt Baker, so yeah, good. Not really much negative to say about Britt Baker there. She'll still be there. And then you'll just have Sheeta just as the champion again. And it's like, you know, not to say that you'd expect more, but it's sort of like, oh, yeah, there's the four women, you know, there's some XWE wrestlers. There's one with a bunch of controversy. There's a, there's a match, you know, the match will go 15 minutes. We'll get three and a half, four stars from Elta. So therefore, because it's going to get a good star rating, it was just good by default. But, you know, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm asking. I'm just saying, like, that's the women's... So, I don't know. Yeah, carry on. Interesting. Sorry. Yeah, then the next match is Darby Allen and Sting versus AR Fox and Swerve Strickland in a tag team coffin match. Um, yeah, I... 
I would not have predicted any kind of match like this five years ago, looking at the first All-In. Good to see Sting. That's great and all. But I I don't know. I, I don't I my thirst to watch Sting wrestle is lessening every day. Mm -hmm. It's not going up. It's a depreciating thing for me. I don't care at all about Darby Allen anymore. Darby Allen used to be one of the focal points of AEW. He used to be a, a potential big star, and then he had scandals come out about him. And yeah, uh, I like Swerve Strickland. I like AR Fox. Yeah, they're good talents. They're some of the best wrestlers in the company. So at least yeah. they're on the show. Well, Kevin, I gotta say this. I mean, remember when Sting like made his debut? in aw december i vividly remember this this was like the first week of december 2020 they're still running in daily's place sting like in shivani like erupts on commentary sting comes out it was like oh my god I, it was generally like a shocking moment it was like an unexpected omg thing it was, it was one of the hottest moments that buzz aw created in their like four odd years of you know running a show to this point and you know now it's like okay sting's 64 and a half you know give it a month or two, he'll be closer to 65 than he is 64. He's already wrestled a number of times. There's been a number of infamous sort of spots with Sting where it's like on botches and it's like, oh, why is he taking that spot? Why is he going through the table? Why is he doing that? He's now 64 and a bit. This match should be a bit just Darby Allen versus Swerve Strickland or some combination, something involving them because I guess the principle of all in five years ago would have been Darby Allen versus Swerve Strickland or something. Some creative match like that. But instead, you know, it's about Sting. It's, you know, it's all oh, this coffins, pal. It's Sting. He's 65, pal. Darby Allen. Like, I, I don't know. Am I being too negative? Is this me with rose tinted glasses? I'm looking, we're looking at this from five years ago. What all in the vision promised, the vision showed, versus now, five years later, what we're saying. Am I being critical? I don't know. I don't know if you're being critical, but I will say this Tony Khan and AEW has afforded a lot of luxury with this card. Because, like, the, the people in Europe are so starved to be a part of something mm. big in American, yeah. North American wrestling, that people literally bought tickets to the show not knowing a single match, not knowing a single wrestler that was going to appear on the show, not knowing anything about this show. 80,000 people went and bought a ticket. So you can literally, at that point, you can put on any show you want. And that's what AEW has done. Literally, they're putting on anything. There's not really a ton of effort or thought, it seems like, from my point of view being put into this card and it's a lot of multi-man matches some of them will be fun sure the goals of the elite cody bushi kenny omega and hangman page versus takashita and juice robinson and jay white that's going to be a fun match but like the way i look at it the way i look at it, if i'm doing an all-in show why not do kenny omega versus jay white you know why not do ibushi versus hangman page in a one-on-one -on -one match you know what I mean? Like, why are we getting Will Ospreay versus Chris Jericho? No disrespect to those guys. Can Chris Jericho, realistically, I'm not even trying to be mean, can Chris Jericho keep up with Will Ospreay in the ring? Like, what, what is, like, I, I don't know. I don't get it. I, I'm confused by the, the, I'm puzzled by the construction of this card. Yeah, and I mean, I've seen the, the criticism of Tony Khan in recent weeks with, I mean, the word thing I've seen thrown out is laziness. When it comes to this, because you've sold out Wembley because there's such a starve and a thirst for just any big show. And there's a, an AW audience over in the UK who a bunch of them are traveling, you know, six, 12 hours just to be a part of this because it's like the biggest thing for them, you know, to be a part of an AW show and event. So you, you trot out this card, which, yeah, you know, I'm sure the matches will probably all rate well. I'm sure, like, you look match by match, I'll all get three and a half stars. Four and a half stars. I'll get the uh, the the Meltzer bonus where because Tony Khan wrote it on a piece of paper, gets an extra star. Yes, you know. So I'm sure that there'll probably be nine out of ten show based on star ratings of matches. But I don't know. It's just the principle of the card construction itself, as you allude to. Th they could easily do one, two, three, like dream sort of big time one on one matches. Matches where you go all in twenty three. You know. Yes, there was MJ and Cole, but you had Omega versus this guy, or you had Abushi's big first AW match versus this guy, or you had this match happen. Like, I don't know. I, this has been luxury has been afforded because they've sold out because there's the starving first. But yeah, that being said, Kevin, one match I am actually genuinely looking forward to though the Stadium Stampede. Um, I really like those matches. 
Uh, I remember the, the first one they did 21, I think would have been or 2020, whatever. I, I just like that match. That's a fun match. That concept works. I look forward to saying that in the UK or how they, how they do that with the wrestlers involved. I mean, Kingston, Cassidy, best friends, Lucha brothers, Moxley, Claudio, Will Yuta, and they're, they're still going to announce more, but it's going to be just an absolute car crash of fun. Um, that I have nothing but good things to say. That's going to be a fun match. A bit wild that John Moxley and these guys, you know, the, the Blackpool Combat Club and Eddie Kent, like their involvement's just this going to be this big yeah. circus, this stadium stampede. But I'm looking forward to it, pal. I can speak for myself. MJF versus Adam Cole. That's the match that I think everybody wants to see. I think that's the match here that, in theory, would have been selling the tickets if they needed to sell tickets for this show. But yeah, I mean, this is the one. It's the hottest storyline in the company. It only makes sense that they're main eventing. And uh, it's one that I want to see. No, it's, it's, a, it's a fitting main event because everything you mentioned, I mean, the storyline, this actually has a story. This has a lot into it, which, you know, it, it, it's a big deal. So I can't really see what they do with this. I mean, MJF being, as we've discussed, the guy who's been AW's real you know, shining star in many regards last few years. And Adam Cole, who, I mean, he was in the... Being the elites back six, you know, seven years ago, back at the kind of the, the genesis of all in. So, and that sort of time period generally before we went to the E. So, yeah, no, I look forward to it. And I think the crowd's going to be really hot for this. I don't know how the crowd's going to be throughout the show. It works to be I think they'll probably be pretty good the entire event, regardless, just because they're starved of content. But get to this main event. I think they're going to be switched on, going off for like anything they do. MJF will turn away and like tease turning on. Cole crowd will just be like, and the crowd will be like going off. Then Cole go to hug, but then pull away, and crowd like, ah, you know, crowd's just gonna be into it regardless. So, now I look forward to it, Kevin. I'll ask you. I mean, the match you're most looking forward to, just to clarify, it is Cole and MJF. It is. That is correct. Yeah. Cool. Gotcha. Now I just wanted to confirm that because I, mean, I asked that question like ten minutes ago, fifteen minutes ago before our preview. Just wanted to make sure. So it is that one. Cool. Um, for me, it's probably Stadium Stampede, and then that one. Um, Cole and MJF. Do they do anything with CM Punk on this show, pal? Do you think? I was I wondering know. that. CM Punk's not on the card. I thought we were going to get Punk versus Joe. That was the rumor. But I guess CM Punk can't be in the same room as the Elite. So the same building, same arena, same locker room. So there you go. There goes that, pal. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that insane? Like, and I guess going forward, is that what they're going to do with AW pay per view events? You're going to have to put the same punk match to open or put the elite match to open and then get them out of the building. So that by the time main event comes around, you can do the other one. Like, like what kind of formula is that for an event? Imagine double view. He had that. Oh, Cody Rhodes can't be in the same locker room as Roman Reigns. There's too much personal beef there. Get the Cody match done to open the show. Get Cody out of the building. Roman and his crew can come in afterwards. Like, what, what is this? Like, I don't know. Disgusting. Terrible. And pal, Unless there's anything else you want to say, all in, AW, yada, yada. I think it's time, Kevin. Are we ready? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Around the world, around the world. Let's go, baby. So last time you were telling us a story, you were poolside, and some events went down. If you haven't seen or heard that, listen to our last episodes around the world segment. But Kevin, before you get to the continuations, there's something you want to say about around the world as a segment. Yes. So I think um, I, I think one direction we would like to take this uh, this segment in is this. Okay. So like this could be cool, you know, if you guys, the viewers, the listeners, if you want to email us, shoot us an email at eliteheat102 at gmail.com. We'll put the email in the description of this podcast on the the spot the Spotify and the audio platforms and on YouTube. And you can email us about you know questions you have for us if you want us to uh, you want to ask us something in general if you need advice or if you want yeah. us to talk about a specific thing or suggestions anything like that and maybe we can read some of those emails on here if we get some and we'll see what's up we'll see how that goes I think it'd be yeah. a nice direction to go yeah like if there's a topic you know whether it be that about one of our lives or some you know a lot of our audience are either american or overseas that want to know something about australia or my experiences or say some of the questions for kevin or more kevin's stories or they want our opinion on x email through email link as kevin said description of the youtube it'll be in the spotify in all the different audio platforms uh yeah i look forward to saying where that goes so once again just to recap 
floors open to you, the listener. Um, shoot through our email and you know, influence the show. Yeah. Yeah. There you have it, pal. There it is. Around the world. Oh yeah, baby, around the world. So Kevin, let's just resume now. You had you said you had some more on that story or similar stories from that trip regarding you, your trip to Mexico, you're at the pool, yeah. you're having a bit of bit of bev, a bit of sauce. Yeah. Um, do you wanna either carry on with anything, anything you feel is safe for our podcast, or whether it's another story, talk to us. I remember we were talking about this behind the scenes. And you were like, oh, that's the direction for our podcast. You're telling crazy stories like that. And yeah. I went through it. I was like, I can't tell that story. That one, that one, that one, that one. <laughs> so it's like, so what I can tell is, is going to be fun. Our direction, um, for, our direction for the next like month, that is. But yeah, there yeah, you go. There you have it. I want to tie a loose end too from an old previous edition of this. Mm-hmm. I remember one episode or one segment around the world. I told you that I was doing a fruit-based cleanse yes did i tell you how that went did i did i provide a conclusion we didn't get the resolution no we got that you were doing it and what that entailed but we didn't get any follow-up so for one i almost passed out twice in the three days that i was trying to do this diet uh first time was because i decided to work out and go for a run in the 105 degree florida weather while only eating fruit and protein yogurt um so not a great idea that that didn't work out too well for me then the second time, I was like, all right, I'm not going to work out. I'm just going to take it easy. Then, like, halfway through my work day, I was, felt lightheaded. And I was like, all right, I got to get food. Like, I, I got to eat real food. This fruit cleanse, fruit diet, good idea in theory. Did not work out too well. Yeah. Um, but it, it did help me get on track with eating more fruit. And eating more fruit makes you feel just different, you know? You feel overall, like, more energetic, more dynamic. Uh, I don't feel as tired throughout the day and now that I'd be eating fruit like every day so that's always a positive what's so, up kevin you're te- you're telling us now our, our podcast audience that you're eating uh an array a plethora of different fruits and colorful nice fruits with vitamins antioxidants all the positives of that is better than sitting there eating potato chips and kfc watching wrestling pal yeah you know yeah, yeah that's what i'm saying yeah yeah, and I can't say I've done either of those things while watching wrestling. I don't really, I'm not a big chips guy. I hate KFC. But what's your go-to? What's your go-to food of consumption? Like, let's say, you know, R- WrestleMania's on just, you know, a wrestling show's on a big event. You've got a couple of, you know, you, you only have a couple of food items. What is Ke- Kevin getting? What is Kevin Wings, getting? for sure. Wings? Yeah, I'm getting right. wings or, like, chicken tenders, like, tossed in buffalo sauce or something like that. Uh, I love Chipotle too. Chipotle is like a go-to. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, um, like to watch something. Yeah, for like a watch party, wings or like chicken tenders mm-hmm. for sure. That's like okay. that, that's my go-to. And pizza. I'll be sure. I'll be sure to add that to the bit with you know Kevin having the wings. You know, <laughs> you know the pal. I was like, I said, that's one of my favorite bits we do when I'm like. You know, Kevin, you're sitting there, you got the family over, you got the wings, the dip, the beers, you, you, you're relaxed, you're excited, you're, you're energetic, and then X wrestler is going to come out or X happens. But nonetheless, okay, because as you know, Kevin, I address this. If I'm watching, if it's a big pay-per-view, if it's a WrestleMania or a SummerSlam, I'm not at all in. I'll say, I'll say on that. Um, uh-huh. It will be KFC maybe, or if I don't feel like driving five minutes down the road to get KFC, I'll just not have anything you know i'll just say say healthy pal fruit cleanse you know fruit pal uh, pal's a fruit cleanse pal <laughs> 105 degree runs and passing out pal fruit cleanse there you um, go. but no I, yeah i don't know i, I just want that, that topic interesting like, like what do you watch while you know what do you eat while watching uh, wrestling or watch alongs or yeah you know. yeah i mean for parties for me for family parties it's all spanish food Mm-hmm. You know, rice and beans and pork and empanadas and, you know, all these other things that you won't understand or the listeners won't understand. Now, empanadas, pal. I'm, I'm cultured, pal. Yeah. You know, what a, you know what a chicharrone is? Couldn't tell you. What's a, what's a chicharrone? It is, um, it's a, it's a pork chunk. Well, it depends oh. where you go, but in Puerto Rico, it's a chicken chunk. We call, uh, I forgot what we call them. 
right now off the top of my head. But it's are, they, like, are they like herbs and spices, or is there more to just is just a chunk of pork? It's fried. It it's just fried okay. in like sasom, which is a seasoning, right? And adobo, and pepper and stuff like that is fried and very greasy, and it's not the it's not the most favorable part of a pig that you want to eat. It's very fatty. Mm-hmm. In the Caribbean, we eat a lot of pork. But not the good, not good tender cuts of pork. You know, we eat like the ears and the tail and, you know, the fatty part of it. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they, there's a, and I like the, the rice that you scrape at the, at the end of the pot. Oh, man. Oh. So good. Nice and crispy, greasy, delicious. Love a lot of greasy food. Kevin, you absolute, you greasy dog, pal. You love that greasy food, pal. Um, also, one other thing, I just want to ask you, uh, any thoughts on, I mean, we addressed this a few weeks back for our Around the World segment. I just want to get your ongoing opinion. Any thoughts on the Mets, pal? Have you, has the last month changed how you view them? Are you now excited for what's to come? Like, what, where are you at for the Mets? Pal? I'm tuned out of the Mets season right now, the 2023 season. I keep my finger on the pulse, but I, I haven't watched yeah. a game in a while. I just don't see a point of watching this team with a three hundred sixty million dollar payroll, watching them lose every night, and watching guys that I've never heard of, like playing second base or pitching, or just not interested in that. Don't have enough time in the day for that. Uh, but there's a lot of young and upcoming and exciting prospects. So their their farm system is now one of the best in the league after making all these trades, doing the sell off at the trade deadline. So I'm excited for what is to come in the future, what moves would be made, but this season is a it's a dead season. So Kevin, to clarify, how much are they paying for their their roster? It's like I said, 360 million. It's somewhere in that range. They are the most expensive payroll in baseball. Uh, it's they be they've surpassed the Yankees and the Dodgers, which was incredible. It would, like just in and of itself is amazing. I, I can't believe the Mets are here, but I don't understand where all that money went. I don't know. Kevin, 360 million and the team wins 46.3% of their games. Yeah. They can't even win half their games. Correct. That, 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 Kevin, that's why you support like a, a good team like the Arizona Diamondbacks. 62 and 61. We're, we're, we are bumming the, the Padres right now, pal. We're 6-3 up. This, this is a team. Kevin, the Diamondbacks are America's team. This is a baseball franchise that they're, they're rich in history. They've got a lineage of championships. There's no steroid drama. They're a clean franchise. Kevin, this is why, if you've seen the light, you're going to support the mighty Diamondbacks, pal. Oh, man. You're talking heavy about an expansion team, pal. They're literally, Kevin, a, how dare you? They're literally Kevin, an expansion how, team. Kevin, for an expansion team, at least they're above 500. They... They won one World Series in their, what, 20-year existence, 25-year existence, which is good, I guess. Good for them. Yeah. Yeah, good for them. Kevin, are you publicly trashing the people of Arizona? <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Kevin, those people, those people have been through a lot, okay? They lost the NBA Finals because of Scott Foster. They, you know, they've signed Durant. They're paying a lot of luxury tax. They're not going to get past the first round of the playoffs this year in the NBA. They're going through a lot, Phoenix. And yeah, they have the ball. worst NFL team in the league, too. Don't forget that. They lost their hockey team. Their hockey team moved to fucking Canada. So, Kevin, also, NFL season's coming up. Um, oh, I want your thoughts as well. Just t- tell the people, who's your team? What, what are you excited about in the 2023-24 NFL season, pal? Yeah, big New York Giants fan. Uh, Saquon is back. That's good. Saquon's here to stay for one year at least. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see. I mean, we had a good showing last season, second round of the playoffs. Lost in embarrassing fashion to the Eagles, but still got to the second round of the playoffs for the first time since the Eli Manning regime won a Super Bowl in 2011. So that was great. Hats off to Daniel Jones for that. Um, beat the Vikings in the first round. It was a hell of a game. Yeah. That one I'll never yeah. forget. Uh, yeah. I'm excited to see where the, if they can build on that performance and if they can get back uh, into the playoffs and make a big run. Uh, things are looking up in, in uh, New York football. You know, the Jets are good. They got Aaron Rodgers. Giants are good. 
Uh, you know, the Mets and Yankees suck, so it's not really much of a baseball thing going on. The Knicks are good, but the Nets suck. Hockey, yeah. all three teams are good right now in the, the tri-state area. So, But big football, big hopes. New York football's back. New York football's yep. been down bad for a long time, for a decade. The Jets and Giants have been absolutely awful. So <laughs> it's good to see them both back and thriving. Now, how long, how many years do you give it for Gary V buys the Jets? Do you give that five years, ten years? <laughs> I don't know. He's got to be a billionaire first, so give him ten years. He'll figure it out. He'll, he'll, he'll create some, some startup company and sell the stake for $2.5 billion, and he'll own the Jets. Yeah, I'd love to sound that, Kevin. I'm just looking forward to seeing my Titans run out there for another year. Tennessee, I love that franchise. Like, uh, Kevin, the Tennessee Titans... I mean, Derrick Henry is absolutely, he's a bull of a man, pal. You know, pal, if you, if you were standing still, Derrick Henry ran at you, he'd send you into next week, pal. He would, he would just bowl through you like a steam train. I think our, our offensive line, pal, our D line, Tennessee Titans, watch out, baby. This is our year. Our wide receivers are good. It, it's fantastic, pal. Yes, sir. All right, pal. It's the main event now. Can I continue my story from last week? Yes. Do it. All right, so where 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 uh, where should I pick up? Uh, the ambulance was just caught, was or something to do with the the she didn't been in the pool. I, I remind me, catch me up, pal. I forget where we left off, but run us right, so it. basically to recap for those who don't remember, I was at the bar with a a former significant person in my life at a resort in Mexico, and she went off, did something, whatever, and I had another girl approach me. It was like, hey, your girl's hot. And I was like, okay, cool. Thinking, you know, get some action going on here, you know? And then that girl that approached me was like, hey, your girl's hot. Passes out in a bush. Has to be carried out. And she's drunk. Is out of her mind at three in the afternoon. So there goes that. Um, you know, I still, still had a, a pretty interesting day. Interesting night, regardless. Now. Interesting. I love that. I love that use of wording. Carry on. So they were doing like an aerobics class or whatever. I don't know if, if, if aerobics is even the right term. I don't know. They're doing a class in this resort in the water that my person I was with is do is partaking in this class, and the host of the class was also hitting on her and was calling her guapa uh, numerous times. So for those of you who don't know, in Mexico, when you refer to a woman as guapa, that's like you're calling them like sexy, you know. That's like, and I and she kept saying that over and over again. She, oh, guapa. Papa, and I was like, hmm, okay, interesting. I guess I know how to pick him. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Whatever. So I'm like, I'm watching this play out, and I'm just like, what is going on right now? Is it the, is it the like, <laughs> is the the tequila? Is it is it the tequila? Am I imagining these things? Am I am I imagining this right now? Did this even happen? Are you just imagining this? But I was the alcohol. Yeah, I'm thinking I had too many tequila shots. Too many margaritas, too many frozen mango margaritas. Oh my god! <laughs> and and it it just it was like such a surreal. Uh, it was a surreal experience. God, there's so many stories that I cannot tell from this yep. vacation that I will never tell. Um, that I don't want to speak about ever again. But the ones that I can <laughs> tell are really entertaining. Um, oh no! Yeah, so. So what was... can you disclose on this podcast? Do you have any other things you can disclose before we move on to next week? So this week's advancement in the, the Kevin Mexico files was a, a pool class where the instructor's like, oh, guapa, guapa, over and over again. Yeah. To, okay. And yeah. the way she was saying it was very seductive. Yeah. So like I asked her, not, not the instructor, I asked my person I was with, I was like, are you picking up on this too? You know, it's like, you see... Like, she's talking to you more than she talks to anyone else. Like, I know you're nice. I get that. And I'm nice. But still, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, read the room. Like, can you say this? Like, yeah. You know. Like, am I crazy? Because, like, I don't want to just go up to her and be like, hey, this girl wants to, you know, hang out with you. Wants you know? to, wants to, how you doing? Yeah. We use Enzo more. Like, she wants to, how you doing? Yeah, I don't yeah. want that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to just come up and, and assume, you know, assume things. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. it was one of those, it was just one of those things. Um, God, that, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. So the, basically, long story short, 
the person I'm with gets super hammered. And I had to carry her out, too. And it was like, oh my god, bro. Like, so it just triggered something in my mind. When you mentioned that, that analogy a couple weeks ago about, like, carrying people out. You know? Like, I've been On there. The ambulance, yeah. Yeah, I've been yeah. there. Literally, I've been there. I literally is carrying this person out to the room. And I was just like, get yourself together, bro. Like, come on. You know? Legendary. Yeah. yeah the, 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 this is why I Late Hate is the best podcast in wrestling and just the best podcast generally. No other podcast gives you this sort of insight, these sort of r- stories, this sort of ridiculous analysis. We cover everything. And Kevin, unless there's anything more you want on that, I think we're good to get out of here for today. But, well, okay, so I have more on this whole oh. trip. I have more on the whole trip. Do you want to save it for next week, or do you want me to just go? I want, I want this to be an ongoing thing. I want this to be a week within for at least like a month. Your your Mexico files, your trip files. Right. You know, so right. cool. th- last week it was the the, the lady who was hitting on the, you know the, the the partner, and then she collapsed in a bush because she was blackout drunk. That was last week. Yes. This week it's the swimming instructor saying guapa, and then you know you being like, "How you doing? Like, what's going on?" Yeah. So that that's that's this week. Yeah. We're, 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 we're trying to walk a tightrope here. What can we can disclose without the podcast getting derailed? Yeah. What we can't disclose. Um, but yeah, for now, Kevin, I think we can park it there and save for next week. Yeah, there you go. Yep, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story about how I thought I was going to get kidnapped in Mexico next week. So, oh my god, wait, I want to hear that now. What? Okay, we'll call it there. <laughs> Easy.